Support for Black and Gold, Remembering the WSU Plane Crash, is provided in part by the DeLoss v. Smith Senior Citizens Foundation and Center, supporting KPTS and its mission to enrich the life and character of Kansas. As a locally owned fourth generation bank serving Central Kansas, Fidelity Bank understands the importance of family and community service. We're proud to support this documentary of remembrance. Online at FidelityBank.com. Fonastock is your trusted name for providing plumbing, heating, air conditioning, electrical, and fireplace sales and service. When you want it all to work, Fonastock won't let you down. This program was produced in high definition thanks to a grant from the K.T. Wiedemann Foundation, Incorporated, supporting youth, education, and arts in our community. We pause for a moment to ponder deeply life and death. As a football game comes to an end, we acknowledge that the game of life also comes to an end for each of us, for our teammates, coaches and fans no longer with us. We know the game has ended in victory for them as they are now with you, the master coach. Their unseen presence here today will give inspiration to all of us. Since we the living still have time on the clock, we ask for your help and guidance as we give our very best to the game of life. No letting up but onward and upward to new victories. On Saturday nights during the 1960s, black and gold colors were proudly displayed throughout the Wichita State University campus as the Shockers football team took to the field. Despite the team's losing record, fans continued to cheer their home team. After the college became an official state university in 1963, WSU underwent a rapid growth spurt. The university felt it needed to boost its national visibility. Football, the beloved sport of high schools and colleges across the Midwest, fit the bill. We felt that as an emerging big-time school, we needed to have a big-time football program. And we had already achieved big-time basketball status, so it seemed like a natural uh, link, I think, to, to uh, raise our stature. Sports is a big deal, and it's a big deal for community support, and so the fact that KU wins a national championship of some kind, it, it means money and it means community support. So certainly it was, it was important for that reason. Bert Katzenmeyer was hired in 1968 as the university's athletic director. His first order of business was to revitalize the Shockers football team. Katzenmeyer was instrumental in securing the support and funding needed to build Cessna Stadium. It was a point of of uh, sales, as it were, on the part of the administration to sell people, look at what we're doing in athletics, football in particular. Uh, and so there were really high hopes, high expectations for the football program at that point. There's a complete new picture down at Wichita, Ben, the new staff, a uh, new squad, uh, a new stadium, and uh, the new turf, and tremendous enthusiasm. What's it all add up to? Well, let's hope that it adds up to a bright future. In order to build a winning team, Katzenmeyer needed a winning coach. He recruited Ben Wilson in 1969. Wilson came from the University of Virginia, where he was a top-rated offensive coordinator. Prior to that, he compiled an impressive record as a winning high school coach in Ohio. Uh, Bert Katzenmeyer was, and Wilson and the other people were clearly hired to try to upgrade our our winning record and our, our stature as a football team. Wilson brought Bob Seaman on board as the new offensive coordinator. Seaman had worked under Wilson in Ohio, and together they hit the trail mid-season to recruit a number of young players from Ohio and surrounding states. 
back then it was like childhood dreams to, to get football scholarships. And being offered a, a foot, football scholarship, full ride at Wichita State meant a lot to me. Most of the blue chippers, if you will, were already committed to other schools. And so what they brought along were people, were marginal players, such as myself. Okay, fairly good athletes perhaps, okay, but not the biggest people in the world. The second year, they start bringing in some pretty good players that were somewhat like All-Staters, a couple uh, uh, high school All-Americans. Uh, and you could see that the program was you know, starting to take off uh, to a certain extent. I ended up going to Wichita. I was an undersized, 150, 160 pound, you know, running back, wide receiver. And, and um, uh, it was the place that I ended up. It was, and it was probably one of the best things I ever did. Before Wilson came on board, the Shockers had not won a single game the prior season. In his first year as head coach, Wilson brought two wins for the Shockers, the first and last games of the 1969 season. The whole season that we were here, I remember we, went, we won the first game of the season and the last game, and I remember my mom saying, you know, those are the most important ones. So we got those two done, which was really good. I always uh, got excited about a win, but I, I usually got excited even if they happened to lose, uh, which they did on occasion, of course. But the winning was uh, exhilarating. One of my sayings was, uh, I don't care who wins as long as it's the Shockers, and I still feel that way. And uh, I, I enjoyed it immensely. The Shockers played their first game of the 1970 season against Arkansas State before a record-breaking 30,000 home fans. Despite the support, the team lost the game and also lost the next two away games against Texas A&M and West Texas State. They were optimistic, however, about their next game at Utah State. Katzenmeyer had arranged for the team to fly to away games on a charter plane through a company based out of Oklahoma City. We uh, put it out to bid, and uh, we chose uh, this airline. We, we had, uh, he had researched it, and he had gotten a lot of compliments on them and saying that they were, they were doing their very best to try to accommodate people. And so he chose to go with them. They had been in the business for a number of years, but this getting uh, the Wichita State as a contract was something very important to them. And it was their desire to show the boys various different things on a trip. In other words, if we passed over something that was very important, they had researched it and told us what we were going over. On October 2nd, the team departed Wichita at 9 a.m. in two Martin 404s that were dubbed the Black and Gold Planes. They had separated us by first team and second team, the black and, and the gold. The gold was the first team and the, the second team was the, the black team. So you had uh, 22 players, first team offense and defense on one plane and second team offense and defense on the other plane. There was three uh, couples, uh, six individuals that had won a trip to fly with the team uh, to, to Utah State. Uh, and I believe they sold the most season tickets to get on the trip. Those three couples, because of what they had done, they put all of them on the gold plane, on the first team plane, and they took the, uh, all of the assistant coaching staff and put them on the black plane. The, Coach Ben Wilson and, and his wife, which was very unusual that she ever went on a trip, um, were on the first, first team plane. And the team trainer, um, <clears throat> the athletic director, and ticket manager were all on that plane too. It was kind of a, a, you know, a benefit that week for, for everybody that was traveling that was normally didn't travel with us to go with the, the gold plane. According to the National Transportation Safety Board or NTSB report, pilots for both the black and gold planes received flight plans to Logan, Utah. The flight plan took the planes from Wichita west to Denver where they would stop and refuel, then proceed northwest through Wyoming. The planes were scheduled to arrive in Logan, Utah at 2 p.m. that afternoon. This was back even when you, know, you had plenty of jets that people chartered, and here we were chartering these propeller-driven planes, and we had to stop in Denver to refuel. 
then the planes were uh, side by side and uh, the sports information fellow, Connie, came over to me and said, Gus, you're supposed to be on the gold plane and uh, there's a spot for you over there. And I said, no, I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable on the black plane and, and uh, I have this book that the player gave to me. I'm reading, I'm enjoying it. I, I think I'll just stay there. On the flight to Denver, the Gold Plains co-pilot, Ron Skipper, told some of the passengers that he would take the scenic route from Denver to Logan and show them some points of interest. Skipper bought the aeronautical sectional charts while the plane was refueled in Denver. A lot of kids probably never seen the mountains before. Well, let's go up the, you know, see the, the passes and the, on the mountains, and I can imagine these kids sitting by the windows or other teammates standing up and now is looking over them to look out the windows to see what was down there and uh, probably talking and you know carrying on look at this look at that both planes left denver at 12:30 p.m the black plane headed north following the original flight path the gold plane headed west taking the new scenic route the scenic route followed highway 6 past georgetown and silver plume towards loveland pass Loveland Pass in that area is a very scary, steep operation. The railroad built a famous uh, piece of track there called the Georgetown Loop in the 19th century because the pass was so steep, they had to loop uh, many, many times to get the, r the railroad up that grade. So it's a tremendous fast increase in uh, elevation, which everybody familiar with the area knows. So that led to many questions as to, of all places, um, to fly um, and to fly low looking at scenery, that was maybe the worst one. A plane chart by Wichita State University has crashed in the Colorado mountains near Idaho Springs and Silver Plume. Tell me if there are if there are any known fatalities. Well, I I'm fearful. Let's say that there are a number of them. Yes, but there was approximately 40. Uh, they counted, and we're unable at this time to determine how many of the survivors there are. Uh, it was just the one plane that went down upstairs, is that correct? Yes, there was a plane following him. I don't know. I think that one was okay. In testimony to the kind of people that were on this plane, by uh, the many gold football helmets and football shoes strewn around the area, a couple of the helmets are melted and some are relatively unscathed, being thrown clear of the wreckage. The scene is one of solemn silence. The flames still burning in this plane, wrecked, charred, ruined. There aren't words I can think of to describe this other than a holocaust of death. The gold plane entered into a box canyon. The plane did not have enough time to gain the altitude needed to clear the continental divide. The canyon was also too narrow to turn the plane around. Reports state that Skipper initiated a sharp right turn across Highway 6 in an attempt to turn around and gain altitude. Captain Danny Crocker then took the controls and stated, I've got the airplane. He initiated a sharp left turn and the plane's nose went down. The gold plane crashed into Mount Trelease at approximately 1 p.m. Of the 40 passengers aboard, only nine survived. Oh, boy. Man, this is it.
This is it. I didn't realize there was still this much stuff up here. Buddy was moving since I was in the seventh grade, man. And the last thing he did, he looked at me right before they hit the thing, and he knew it was some trouble. And I just feel bad about it. Yeah, it doesn't go away. I was sitting in the back, the right-hand side, and I was looking out, and the road just kept coming up, and I knew something wasn't right. Sitting by the window, I, about five minutes before the crash, I, I, could, I was got a little concerned that I could see some old trails and so forth, and maybe mines that were above our elevation. And uh, I, would, I don't know that I would, I didn't do anything about it other than get up to see what was going on in the cockpit. And, uh, the, uh, they had maps out, topographical maps, uh, trying to determine where they could cross. And at that point, I, I came to the conclusion that we were, as I looked out the window, could only see green instead of blue. I, but that was my recollection of becoming alarmed at what, what we were doing, not having any knowledge of piloting and so forth. I turned to go back into the cabin area. There's a short storage area, about three feet, and the plane banked sharply. Whether it was to the right or left, I'm not sure, but, and then it banked again. And as it banked the second time, I fell to the floor, felt the, I had trees impacting the wings or the fuselage, and I think at that point I was knocked unconscious and um, ended up outside of the airplane. I was at the back part of the plane on the um, second seat from the end uh, on the outside, um, talking to Gene Robinson, and uh, when I noticed things wasn't right, the plane started banking over to the left, and he pulled it back and he banked back towards the right. And on the third time, it started coming down. That's when I noticed the trees, uh, topping the trees. And, and, and uh, after that, it was a big impact. I was sitting in the very back and on the on the right hand side and, and then we had uh, like the wick was talking about the banks the first one scared me and then the second one I knew we were in problem we were in trouble and then uh, the cabin I was so I moved back to the aisle section of the seat and I looked at the cabin I could see through the cabin through the through the windows in the where the pilot and the co-pilot were and then I saw the impact, and then I, uh, I, I, I flew into a pile. I didn't have my seatbelt on, and, and I flew into a pile. And then uh, I, when, it came, when it came to rest, I, I just looked up, and there was a hole to my, right, right about there somewhere. And I, I picked up, and I got out of it and just fell down. And then uh, there was some Tom Reeves and, and Johnny Taylor and Glenn Costell and Mike Bruce and I were just basically right over here and then the thing, then the fire started. When it impact, it, it, it throwed me straight ahead and it hit, and my, I could, ribs hit the seats and I could see dust coming down through the light 
And I hollered out to say, hey, here's the place, here's the hole. So I crawl out. When I crawl out, I walked around the plane. And I said, we can't go back in. And, and I said, well, we got to get away because this thing going to explode. Then we, a group of us, went down the hill. And uh, uh, one, a couple of guys from down there who was working on the guardware on, on the road that came up and helped us down, put us in there car and taking us to one of the local towns close by. We lack precise information about survivors. We have been in contact with the doctor in Idaho Springs who treated by his statement 12 persons who were sent on to St. Anthony's Hospital in Denver. You had no warning at all. You had no idea. Did you feel a sensation of uh, losing altitude? No, not, uh, not a great deal. I don't put it really. Survivors included Mike Bruce, John Hoheisel, Glenn Costell, Keith Morrison, Bob Renner, Dave Lewis, Rick Stevens, Randy Jackson, and the plane's co-pilot, Ron Skipper. The, the terrible reality is that, the, and for these, these guys that, were, that had to crawl out uh, and, and know that many of their close friends were, were still alive and just couldn't get out, uh, and that's, that's a tough deal for them. I, I've always, I, I think of them. Because they, they, they've had to live with something that I was spared, and I, I know that was difficult. While survivors were being treated in area hospitals, Colorado's Alpine Rescue Team faced a daunting task back at the crash site. Uh, we got up there and we were instructed to, to circle the area and look for uh, people that might have escaped somehow or other alive. This is probably the worst mission that I've seen in terms of outcome. It's so clear what the outcome is. Um, I didn't get to see the people who had walked away from that plane. Uh, and uh, it was a fairly short time. We understood that it was gonna be a removal, not a rescue. My main concern, I think, was for some of the younger guys than I, and I was relatively older than most of the team, as, as you can picture. Al Petrick was one of the few senior members of the Alpine Rescue Team. Most of the teams were made up of youth volunteers. John Putt was only 12 years old when he completed a year of training and joined the Alpine Rescue Team. The WSU plane crash would be John's first mission. I heard that the team was going on this plane crash and just decided to get a ride down to the old team shack and see if I could hitch a ride and go help out. And uh, it was Mostly the high school guys were loading up the equipment and heading up, so they just threw me in the back of a Suburban, and I ended up going on the mission with them. Trees perfectly cut, um, and a forest that was black as fresh asphalt. That's all there was. And our responsibility was to walk the perimeter, um, and not pick up anything, just, you know, call things in or, or identify them. And, you know, it, 
as a 12-year-old kid. Um, I was, I was, I think, handling it pretty good until I found a wallet. And I think the only reason I found the wallet is because it was brown and everything else was just ash black from the fire. And um, I, I just opened up this wallet instead of just leaving where it was. And there was a picture of the family. And I was just so gripped by fear. And I had never, well, I never have since that day felt anything so horrifying. And we, I just felt, I just frozen in that moment and could not wait to get off that mountain. In Logan, Utah, the black plane arrived and landed on schedule. The players and the assistant coaching staff aboard were unaware of the crash and the fate of their teammates. So we land in Utah and my, I'm sitting in, at the, on, the, on the window seat and I look out uh, at the tarmac and I see like four or five uh, TV station reporters. There's a bunch of people out there. And I thought to myself, boy, they're really gonna cover this game really big with all these reporters out here. We were told to stay on the plane and Coach Seaman left the plane and, and then came back and took roll and then left again and then came back onto the plane and told us um, what had happened. And there was, of course, uh, silence. You, you, you could have heard a pin drop. And uh, the, the thoughts that went through our minds, or my mind specifically, you wanted, well, what, what happened? When do we find out? Uh, how bad is it? Did, it? did it leave some people? What was it? It was all those questions that went through our minds at that time. The next order was that they were going to send buses for us. And they were going to take us to the hotel. We were supposed to go to our rooms and not talk to anybody. I got a hold of my dad, and, and uh, um, he he answered the phone, and he was he was fine until he heard my voice. Then he completely broke down. The, the weirdest thing for me was that I didn't congregate with the other players. I mean, I didn't sit around and, and talk to them about anything with the other players. I went and sat outside next to a creek bank, okay, and watched the water go by for, I don't know, a half hour to an hour. I don't have any idea. But so I, I didn't even think about even calling my parents. That's how crazy it was. I just, it was just the way it was. You know, being from a small town, you know, when news travel, you know, travel real fast and, and uh, I felt I better get in touch with my mom and my dad also, but most of my mom. And because uh, I know people are going to be saying things that they didn't know what was going on. My concern wasn't about my cuts and stuff. I was concerned calling her. Was, uh... The WSU Athletic Department had lost the bulk of its staff, including Carl Farbach, the Director of Admissions, Floyd Farmer, the Associate Athletic Director, Marty Harrison, the Student Equipment Manager, and Tom Reeves, the Team's Trainer. WSU Athletic Director Bert Katzenmeyer and his wife Marion both perished that day, as well as head coach Ben Wilson and his wife Helen. It was in the evening, the doorbell rang and it was a family friend of ours had come and she said, I've come to pick you up. And you know, when you're a kid, you're just, you know, adults and they tell you this is what you need to do. So I was like, okay, so um, got my stuff and she took me over to her mother's house, who was my Sunday school teacher. And she said, oh, you're gonna stay here tonight. And I just remember thinking, oh, 
you know, what's going on? You know, I was supposed to stay with my girlfriend, and, you know, I was so kind of annoyed. And I remember thinking, I am going to really, you know, give it to them for, you know, messing up all my plans. We were going to have fun. But they, at that time, they didn't know yet what the results of the crash were. So we didn't know, you know, they didn't know who had survived and who had. So I guess they were waiting to tell me until they had more news. So it was the next morning that she sat me down and she told me that there'd been a crash and she said my mom and dad weren't coming home. There were a number of special supporters and boosters aboard whose lives were also lost. They included Shocker Club President Ray Coleman and his wife Maxine, who had two children, John and Etta Mae Grooms, who also left behind two children, and State Representative Raymond King and his wife Yvonne, who left behind seven children. All in all, 13 children were orphaned as a result of the crash. On October 2nd, I was in college. My first three weeks of college had just ended. I was rooming with my first cousin. I was putting mascara on my right eye lid, or my eyelashes, and I heard the whole broadcast. And I was shocked. I was... I had talked to my mother the night before on the phone and that's how I knew they were on the plane. I went from dorm room to dorm room trying to find someone just to tell. And as I came back around the corner, I collapsed against a wall and two girls to this day, I don't know who they were, helped me call home. I had talked to my next younger sister, Terry, on the phone and she says she remembers crying for me to get home as soon as possible. And we all gathered together in uh, my bedroom, Terry's in my bedroom, and we cried together and we prayed together. Um, Lisa's prayer for a seven-year-old was so precious. She said, you know, things you remember like yesterday, but she said, Dear God, I'm sorry Mommy and Daddy had to die, but I know you needed them in heaven, and Lenny's here to take care of us. Captain Danny Crocker and flight attendants Judy Dunn and Judy Lane perished in the crash, and Wichita State University lost 14 of its most promising young football players. reminded that people lost in Colorado, the way we laughed and talked together, the way we won and lost together. They were great people. They will always be great people. I will always be proud to have known them. The hurt is deep and will remain with us, but we must always remember our friends as beautiful people. I remember they had a memorial in Cessna Stadium several days after the crash. There was a big crowd on hand. The wind was blowing. I had been asked to give a few remarks and I'd written it out. I didn't want to miss anything. And I had trouble holding the, the script. I remember that because of the wind. And the only thing I really remember about my remarks was that I mentioned. I mentioned every one of those kids that didn't survive. It takes courage to face the future after we have had to face disaster. But I believe remembering will make it easier to carry on. Uh, I have to think about Donnie Christian. I, I was a seventh grade pitcher and he was the catcher. <laughs> and uh, 
he came down the street one day when we were seven years old, and we were like brothers from then on. And uh, that was that was tough, you know. He was just like a brother. And but we there was a lot of brothers like that that day. There were some good people out there. The world would have been a lot better place if those people had been still here. Gene Robinson was a good friend of mine, too. And he was, uh, he was the uh, wide receiver. And I was sitting next to him. And, uh, Who? Gene Robinson. Oh, Gene, yeah. And just had a normal conversation when we go up on a trip, you know. And, uh, and he didn't make it out. And to this day, you know, you, you wonder why. Right next to you. You know, just close to you. And then all of a sudden, you don't have a clue what happened to him. And so, um, but I was w wondered about that because he was a real good friend. Carl Kruger was a uh, defensive tackle from Chicago. Okay, made the, the starting team that week of the crash. Okay, so he got the plane only because he was starting, made the starting team. He was my roommate. And so uh, it was very difficult losing him, obviously. You know, and so that was, uh, and so even now, I, you know, I think of him most every day. And the university made sure that there was a team player or two and a coach at every funeral. And so usually you went, if you were a close friend of somebody, they sent the closest. And in my case, John Duran had been my roommate who was in Oklahoma City, and, and we went to his funeral in, um, in Oklahoma City with the coaches, and then to Marvin Marvin Brown, who was out of Solomon, Kansas, to his funeral. John Duran's parents never got over that, and I don't think Marvin Brown's parents, I know uh, Ronnie Johnson's parents, they just, they just didn't. Howard Johnson's son, Ronnie, died in the crash at the age of 21. Howard is 83. Howard hopes that visiting the crash site will help bring closure to four decades of grief. thought that maybe he was on the side of the mountain somewhere alive because they said he'd got out of the plane and we talked about getting in the plane and flying to Denver the next day but the word come back he wasn't a survivor and other people had Other people had come down the mountain and he wasn't one of them. So that's how we found out about it. And we spent two or three days with you in Wichita. And, but they hadn't identified any of the casualties at that point and they wanted dental records and clothing he wore. And I can actually remember them coming and telling me he was alive and I said, I'm sorry, you're wrong. You better check it, you know. I've heard he's alive, and I said, no, he's not. I just, I was very clear that, that he wasn't. How did you know? I just knew. Hmm. Ronnie and I were pretty close. Wichita State University is cooperating fully in this investigation and has made available to the appropriate authorities all correspondence and other information in its possession related to the work of the investigating team. 
there was a feeling that it, it shouldn't have happened. It wasn't just one of those things, uh, like a, a tornado. I mean, there was irresponsible behavior somewhere, and it didn't have to happen. And therefore, there was kind of a anger, I think, and bitterness that it, that it did happen. As I understood your earlier testimony, uh, Captain Cracker was making the decisions on his flight as pilot in command. Is that correct? That's true. He was responsible for the entire operation. Is that correct? That's true. You know, we were all amazed at the scenery and everything. And I noticed very specifically looking down to the ground below, the, watching the highway and the cars, and it's very, very clear. And as we got deeper into the mountains, we could see the peaks, and so we're towering above the aircraft, you know, to the right, to the left. You don't go flying up canyons uh, for sightseeing. And apparently that's what was going on at the time, that, that the pilots decided at who's urging who knows. Maybe the players were urging them, well, let's see some of the Rockies. Let's see it up close. Who knows who, who thought of this? You know, they had to be you know, kind of uh, irresponsible to begin with. The Congress should determine if we must have new legislation to ensure that safe and dependable air charter service is available throughout the country. You were aware, were you not, that there was a member of the Wichita State University football squad standing right behind the uh, cockpit at the time that uh, these proceedings were going on and immediately prior to the time of the impact? Uh, yes, I was vaguely aware of it. Uh, a number of the passengers on board the aircraft had been walking up to the cockpit and going back to their seats. Was there... Uh... Uh, any fire after impact with the trees in the Immediately. Mountain? Immediately? Immediately. There was a great big ball of fire, and uh, that's all you could see was fire. He said, uh, what's the elevation of uh, that peak? And he pointed off to the right, and uh, the, the pilot, or the, the, the one on the right, looked, had the map out and spread out in front of him, and he said it was 13.5. 13,500, and I happened to, I glanced at the map and saw where he was pointing at, and he was, was off back to the right, and that's about the time he made a right turn, a quick right, and then, and then back to the left. Mr. Katzenmeyer would certainly know that his legal powers to sign contracts was as the chief executive officer of the Physical Education Corporation. Now, why uh, he paid as little attention to that in this particular instance, I do not know. There were two entities involved at the university level, the athletic corporation and the university itself. And there were two on the aircraft level. There was Golden Eagle, which provided the pilots and there was this fellow named Jack Richards who provided the airplanes. Would you understand this was sort of a gentleman's agreement? Would you view that a gentleman's agreement that the lease was to start at that particular point, even though the signatures were not on the lease agreement? Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. And that this understanding was with Mr. Katzmeyer, is that correct? That's correct. Richards claimed that he had leased the planes to Wichita State not to Golden Eagle. <laughs> so in effect, Wichita State looked like the operator of some sort of an airline, and of course it didn't have any license to do this, and Golden Eagle apparently didn't have a certificate to operate that large an airplane, and it disclaimed responsibility, and I guess everybody tried to disclaim responsibility, which you would. After four days of hearings and approximately 25 witnesses, the National Transportation Safety Board released its findings. Among its conclusions, it stated, there was no failure or malfunction of the plane. The plane was 2,600 pounds overweight at impact. 
The original flight plan was altered to provide a sightseeing route. The plane was flying over Clear Creek Valley below the mountaintops. After the plane reached the dry gulch area, it was no longer possible to climb over the terrain ahead or turn around and no participants, lessee, or company accepted responsibility for the safety of the flight. It was kind of a blur for a while there. You just did what you needed to do. It's kind of much different nowadays than it was back then. I don't want to say there wasn't any type of support system, but today it's just so much different with, uh, you've got professionals that come in to help people work through these kind of things. As a kid, I really didn't feel like any kind of resentment or anything like that. I, I really didn't. It was, you know, it was just kind of put away, put into a neat little box in somewhere inside me and and not to be opened, because it was very painful. If counselors would have been made available to us, I think myself, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have taken it, okay, because it was something that back then, well, first of all, it, it was something new to anybody, everybody probably, and I probably would have felt uh, macho or man enough that I wouldn't have accepted that, okay, and probably this is my first chance of counseling talking to you. We failed to understand the culture of the football players, and so when they approached, everything was fine. And so we uh, took that at face value, but that was not the case. And uh, I feel that, you know, many years later, our, many of our players suffered emotionally because the university did, did not make a proper intervention. Some of the, of the survivors kind of withdrew within themselves, and other ones were, uh, they were uh, not really open, but I, I, well, I still had friendships with them. They try to get by as best as they can, but you could still see uh, the hurt in them, I think. It was strange. Even after, you know, it's just looking at all the stuff around here, you know, and you said to yourself, I was fortunate enough that I survived it. So. On October 11th, the Wichita State University football team voted 75 to 1 in favor of finishing out the season. Bob Seaman was appointed new head coach. The new start was designated the second season. Armed with only three seniors and six juniors, the team prepared for its first game after the crash against the University of Arkansas Razorbacks in Little Rock on October 24th, only three weeks after the crash. Fellas, time to go to war. Pure and simple time to go to war. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's daggone few people in the world give you guys much credit for being football players. Inexperience. Look around you. There's inexperience. I'm going to tell you something. Inexperience can go right down the drain if you hustle and hit and execute. Hustle, hit, and execute. The first game after the crash had uh, what was known as the beginning of the second season, and it was against uh, highly rated Arkansas, one of the best football teams in the country, and these were all freshmen and sophomores and uh, players that hadn't developed yet. But when we got to that 50,000 seat stadium in Little Rock, and I noticed that the people on the other side of the field at the stadium were getting to their feet. And as, uh, it seemed to go from one end of the stadium to the other. And then I looked down and here was the Wichita State co-captain of the varsity who had survived that crash, and he was on crutches. And in civilian clothes, John Hoiso, one of the original team captains. And then after the coin toss, Bedlam broke loose, and it was 
Arkansas fans were just great. I think we've got some 17, 18 year old freshmen that are maturity wise have grown up tremendously in the past three weeks. That was one of the real rewarding things that as we finished the season and finished what we started was important to us and probably important that we didn't allow things to die with those at Paris on Point. You know, after that I think we, we kind of got back into the groove of being college students again. We had the first winning season for 10 years. So that was in 1972. You know, so you know, we, we, brought, we brought it back. They say memories are a way of holding on to the things we love, the things we are, and the things we don't want to lose. Due to financial constraints, the varsity football program ended after its 1986 season. The memories, however, live on. Well, I think two things can happen in a community. It can either destroy a community or they grow together and they move forward and they learn from it. And I think that's exactly what happened in, in Wichita. It's been really, really healing for me to go to the memorial services and to be able to see the people and be, even though the conversations are brief, because I find it very emotional. Little by little, it's coming into place. I think their legacy of their faith and relationship has been something we've each taken on personally and are passing on as our own legacy. Uh, I waited 19 years ago up to the plane crash, okay? And I think that I went up twice. I went uh, 19 years and 20th year. 20th year, I took my camera. I took a lot of pictures up there. Uh, and I think that that, you know, I, I kind of said goodbye to everybody then. Uh, it seemed like. I had a little bit of a closure. We'll be back up in a few years and look at it. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that uh, but we'll never forget all the individuals who passed in the plane crash. We'll never forget the people who uh, who still living. Too. Uh, the moms and dads. Sure, that's what hurts. You know, that's that's what when I go to the uh, anniversary every year, I think about them. Mm -hmm. All the way. Even my parents was devastated also, but I survived. And you got to think about all those other mothers and brothers and sisters who lost someone here. That's a tough time every year when they come around. And I want our community to know that, that you always been behind us and we appreciate that. And I never want those individuals who perished to ever be, uh, you know, forgotten.
Support for Black and Gold, Remembering the WSU Plane Crash, is provided in part by the DeLoss v. Smith Senior Citizens Foundation and Center, supporting KPTS and its mission to enrich the life and character of Kansas. As a locally owned fourth generation bank serving Central Kansas, Fidelity Bank understands the importance of family and community service. We're proud to support this documentary of remembrance. Online at FidelityBank.com. Fonastock is your trusted name for providing plumbing, heating, air conditioning, electrical, and fireplace sales and service. When you want it all to work, Fonastock won't let you down. This program was produced in high definition thanks to a grant from the K.T. Wiedemann Foundation, Incorporated, supporting youth, education, and arts in our community.